This is Dr. Richard Price of the Price Lab presenting Light Curing. It looks so easy and yet can be so dangerous. The success of the 122 million restorations and 16 plus million sealants placed annually depends upon the curing light and how well it's used. Do we have any evidence that resin restorations are not lasting as long as they could and should? Well, yes we do. In one study, Resin composites placed in private practice only last 35% of the time expected from clinical trials. Looking at a recent study from northern Sweden, we see that the median longevity for resin restorations was six years, with the shortest time for class two restorations. The National Institute for Dental and Craniofacial Research reported that composite resin restorations have an average replacement time of 5.7 years due to secondary decay and fracture of the restoration. Why are these restorations not lasting as long as they could and should? Could the poor longevity of many of these restorations placed in dental offices be due to the fact they are undercured? We know that undercured resin results in increased wear and fracture, reduced bond strengths, secondary caries, increased bacterial colonization, color changes in the resin, breakdown of the matrix, ultimately failure of the resin restoration, and interestingly also it results in increased leachates from the material which can affect its biocompatibility. Almost all restorations placed nowadays are light cured. Now light curing started some 40 years ago using ultraviolet curing lights and here we can see an example of the Nuvolite. This Nuvolite delivered ultraviolet light with a sharp peak around about 365 nanometers. Due to the safety concerns with this light, it was soon replaced with quartz tungsten halogen lamps or plasma arc lights, with the most popular light being the quartz tungsten halogen variety. Some of these quartz tungsten halogen lamps were very powerful. Here we can see an example of the Swiss Master light, which was so powerful it had to be water cooled because of the tremendous heat it generated. The problem we have with the quartz tungsten halogen bulbs is that they are being phased out across the world. Here we can see a map from Wikipedia showing where the bulbs are either banned or soon to be banned. So therefore I think we have a perfect storm. We have the increasing use of resins, the QTH bulbs are being phased out and replaced with LED curing lights, we have increasing use of alternative photo initiators. We have polywave curing lights. And it's very hard to tell these curing lights apart from regular LED curing lights. They both deliver blue light. But because they deliver different wavelengths of light, it's rather like trying to compare gasoline versus diesel. If you put the wrong one into the car engine, the car doesn't work so well. The same thing applies to curing lights. The reason why gas versus diesel is so important is because the most common photo initiator used in dental resins is camphorquinone, which is most sensitive to light around about 470 nanometers. There are alternative photo initiators that are sensitive to light around about 400 to 410 nanometers. If you don't provide light in that range, then the composite doesn't cure quite so well as you'd expect. Because camphorquinone has a bright yellow color, these alternative photo initiators are more commonly found in the bleaching shades of resin or on the translucent shades. They're also sometimes found in the bonding agents. Here we can see two LED curing lights and you'll note that the red line represents a single peak curing light and this has got an irradiance of 750 milliwatts per centimeter squared and a fairly narrow spectral output. The blue line has got an irradiance of 3000 milliwatts per centimeter squared and has a much broader spectral output. Now you may ask, is this really important? Does it matter? Here we can see an image from the Tetric bulk fill brochure. You'll note that they have a new initiator in this material that provides a greater depth of cure, but it is more sensitive to light at 412 nanometers compared to 460 nanometers. Therefore, if your curing light doesn't deliver light at 412 nanometers, which as you see from the red dashed line here, where there is no light in the 412 nanometer region, 
you will not be getting the full benefit of this added photo initiator in Tetric Bulk Fill. You need a polywave curing light and, not surprisingly, Ivoclar Vivident makes a polywave curing light that will activate this photo initiator at 412 nanometers. So having seen that we can have LED curing lights with two very different spectral outputs, let's briefly look at the different ways you can cure resins. I think we're all familiar with the continuous curing mode where the light is on, delivering the same intensity throughout the entire curing time. We also have high energy pulse curing where a very high radiance is provided for a very short time. Many curing lights have these two modes. In addition, we have ramp curing, where the light intensity starts out low and then gradually rises during the curing cycle. We have step curing, where you start out with a low light intensity, which then suddenly jumps up to a high intensity after a certain period of time. And then we have pulse delay, where you deliver a low intensity, you'd wait a while, and then apply a higher intensity to fully cure the resin. Now when you go to the store and buy a light bulb, you usually buy the bulb depending upon its wattage. It's either a 60 watt bulb or a 100 watt bulb, and you know that the 100 watt bulb will give you a brighter light than a 60 watt bulb. Unfortunately, the same thing doesn't apply to dental curing lights. Dental curing lights have usually been sold on their irradiance. And very small changes in the diameter can have a very large effect on the irradiance. Here we can see that if you have two lights, both delivering 1000 milliwatts per centimeter squared, but the light on the left is delivering it over a tip diameter of 9.9 .9 millimeters, whereas the light on the right is delivering it over a tip diameter of 7.8 millimeters. If you calculate the irradiance from these two, you will see that the light with the larger diameter, the 9.9 millimeter diameter, is delivering 1,299 milliwatts per centimeter squared, whereas the light with the smaller tip diameter is delivering 2,092 milliwatts per centimeter squared. This is despite the fact that both lights are equally powerful, both delivering 1,000 milliwatts. You can see how you can be very easily fooled by just simply changing the tip diameter. Now I've described the terms of power in watts and irradiance being power divided by area. Let's look at the term energy density. What's that? If you multiply the irradiance by the time the light's being used, you'll get the energy density and that's reported in joules per centimeter squared. So how much energy is required to cure a resin? Well, the European Commission Scientific Committee on Emerging and Newly Identified Health Risks and the Philips textbook both recommend delivering 16 joules per centimeter squared to cure a two millimeter thick layer of resin. And if we look at the manufacturer's instructions, for example, this product here from Bisco, we'll see they recommend delivering 10 joules per centimeter squared of energy. Let's now look at the manufacturer's instructions and see how they can help us determine the energy density required to cure resins. Here we can see the instructions from 3M for their product Filtex Supreme. You'll see they recommend a minimum intensity of 400 milliwatts per centimeter squared. And that should be used for 20 seconds to cure body, enamel and translucent shades of their product. If you multiply 400 by 20 seconds, you get 8 joules per centimeter squared. For their Dentin A6B and B5B shades, they recommend a 40 second curing time, and that equals 16 joules per centimeter squared. So you can see that 3MSB recommends between 8 to 16 joules. Another really good example of showing you why you need to read instructions is the excellent curing chart from Densply regarding their Smart Light Max. Now, some of you may have seen advertisements for the Smart Light Max stating it has a very fast five second curing time. And you may cure all of your resins for five seconds. But closer examination of their chart shows that yes, while some of their shades can be cured in five seconds, some of them require 35 seconds. 
This means they're recommending that you can deliver an energy range of between 6 joules all the way up to 42 joules if you cure them all for only 5 seconds, then certainly some of their products will be undercured. Now one of the problems we have is that light curing appears so easy. Here we can see an example of less than ideal light curing, but even with this less than ideal technique, we'll see that the top of the resin appears hard. Running a sharp instrument over it, it appears fairly hard. When we turn it over and we look at the bottom, we'll see the bottom is actually quite soft. Unfortunately, we can't do that with our dental resins in our patients. Back in 2010, I described the four core principles of light energy delivery, namely the curing light, the operator technique, the restoration location, depth and size, and the energy requirement of the resin. Here we can see the article that was published, and let's focus in on the curing light, the technique used, the type and location of the restoration, and the energy requirement. Now let's look at the curing light in closer detail. Most of you are aware of using a dental radiometer to measure irradiance. Here we're going to use a beam profiler. Now the beam profiler is a camera that takes a picture of the irradiance coming from the tip. Beam profilers are commonly used when looking at lasers, and we have adapted the use of a beam profiler to look at curing lights. Ideally, the output from a curing light should be a perfect top hat performance, and you want to see red across the entire surface, nice and uniform, even irradiance. Here we can see an example of a curing light that has a power output of 536 milliwatts. But you'll note that the power, or the light, is really just a spike in the center. It's almost like a laser beam. Now the radiance from this curing light is almost 20,000 milliwatts per centimeter squared. You might think it's a really powerful light, but it's just focused in one small spot. Here we can see the beam profile of the Velo curing light. It does deliver a higher power out output of 676 milliwatts, but the irradiance is only up to 1600 milliwatts per centimeter squared. You may think that that light isn't as good as the one above, but in actual fact, this would be a lot better for curing resins than the light above. It's rather like painting a wall with a roller compared to painting a wall with a fine, small artist paintbrush. Do we really see this in our curing lights? Well, yes we do. Here's an example of a curing light. It's delivering 502 milliwatts over the tip, and you might think light's coming out evenly over the entire light tip of 7.7 .7 millimeters. But actually, when you look at it with the beam profiler, you see the light's really focused in just the center, and very little light comes out around the sides. Let's now look at another video on the effect of distance on beam profile. This is an example of a light that has a really poor beam profile and poor performance over distance. Let's now look at the Velo, which has a better performance over distance. As the distance increases, you see here Yes, the irradiance does go down, it maintains still a good top hat, and much more even curing will ensue. So now we've talked a little bit about the curing light, let's think about the operator. I'm sure that most of you here know how to drive, some of you may ski or play golf. And I think you all recognize that in order to be good at any of these things, you have to practice and you have to be taught how to do them. But think back to when you first used a curing light. Were you ever taught how to use a curing light? And if you did receive any instruction on how to use a curing light, what were you told? I found that most of us have been told not to look at the light when curing. We're supposed to shine the light on the tooth and then look away. But think about this. Dentists would never do this prepare a tooth without looking at what they're doing, but yet it appears to be perfectly okay to do light curing without watching what we're doing. 
To see if light curing could be a problem, I took a video of a person light curing a tooth in a deniform. And as you can see, the light's moving around a bit. This is less than ideal, obviously. So this got me to thinking, how good is my light curing technique? Some of you may have a dental radiometer. You need to be aware that there are great inaccuracies both inter and intra-brand. This has been reported by Leonard in 1999 and Roberts in 2006, and most recently by the Price Lab in 2012. Now, although they are inaccurate, dental radiometers are very useful because they can give you a value to compare the same light over time. So if it's 650 when you buy it, and then it stays at 600 all the time, then that's just great. But don't compare the results that you achieve with your radiometer with the results that your buddy achieves next door with his radiometer, because that type of comparison is really meaningless. Since dental radiometers are known to be inaccurate, and also since they do not give you the spectral output from the curing light, I developed the Mark system. The Mark system is a patient simulator that quantifies energy delivery. Here we can see an example of the Mark unit in action. Look at the way the assistant's holding the curing light. She's light curing it, it's moving off the tooth now, coming back on the tooth again. And all this can be seen in the screen on the right hand side, where you can see the radiance is going up and down during curing. This technique delivered 6.2 joules of energy. Using the same curing light, same tooth, same operator, same amount of distraction, let's see what happens when everybody's wearing glasses and is really paying attention to what they're doing. You'll see they adjusted the curing light, they're watching, they're stabilizing the light, and look at the screen on the right. You can see how you're getting a very uniform irradiance, very steady light curing technique, and this time we delivered 13.2 joules per centimeter squared of energy. This is double the amount of energy that was delivered when they weren't paying attention. Inside the mark head, there's a laboratory grade spectroradiometer, and it comes with very easy to use software. Since the introduction of mark, there's been a paradigm shift away from measuring the average irradiance at the emitting tip of a curing light to what actually reaches the material being polymerized. Instead of measuring the light output at the tip of the curing light, or to use this analogy, how much is coming out of the hose, we're actually measuring how much is getting into the bucket or how much energy is getting into the resin. This is the essence of what Mark does. It tells you how much is getting into the resin you're trying to cure. Here we can see a close-up of the two sensor positions. The anterior sensor is one millimeter deep and the posterior sensor is four millimeters deep. They measure the radiance, the spectral emission and the energy that would be received by a resin. Here we can see a cutaway of the posterior sensor and you'll note that the top of the sensor is four millimeters away from the cusp tip. Mark helps us to manage the four core variables. The curing light, the operator technique, the restoration characteristics, and the energy requirement of the resin. Let's look at the spectral emission from four different curing lights measured using Mark. You can see that they're quite different. This information cannot be obtained from a conventional dental radiometer. And because Mark measures the spectrum, Mark can tell us if you're putting the equivalent of eight gallons of diesel or 16 gallons of gas into the resin restoration. So now we know what type of energy is being delivered to the restorations, we can actually manage it. Here we can see an example of two different curing lights being used to cure the simulated restoration. Look how easy it is to get the lower curing light into the tooth. You can even get your finger on top of it to stabilize the head of the LED unit. Here we can see the side view inside the mark unit. You'll note that um, the light on the left, it's impossible to get that at 90 degrees to the actual restoration. And we have found that a 30 degree angle can reduce the energy delivery by 26%. See how easy it is to get the light on the left in place now, compared to the light on the right where there is an angle. Because of the features that Mark offers, Mark is becoming the measurement standard. 
Mark was used in two of Gordon Christensen's reports, both in October of 2010 and May of 2012, when they looked at dental curing lights. We've been using Mark for the past three years at Dalhousie University. We've been teaching our students how to light cure properly. We have several papers published on using Mark, and there have been several presentations at the IADR and AADR. We've been using Mark to teach dentists how to light cure, testing over a thousand dentists with Mark, using good new curing lights, and manufacturer's curing times. We have found that about 10% of the dentists were delivering less than 4 joules per centimeter squared, but also some dentists were delivering 10 times as much energy. The interesting thing is that these dentists had no idea how much or how little energy they were delivering because almost all the dentists didn't watch what they were doing. I realize that this is a messy image, but what we've done here is put all the recordings onto one image. We can see at the very top we have some very straight recordings where the dentist was using the curing light to the maximum. And then in between and below that we have lots of higgledy-piggledy lines where the dentist was obviously falling off the tooth or missing the tooth completely. Now using the same curing light on the same tooth for the same time, but after instruction and showing the dentist how to use the curing light properly, we got this result. This was very quickly achieved using the instant feedback that Mark provides. Again, you'll notice that there are some dentists with a straight line at the top, but everything is all moved up and there's far less variation in the, in the amount of energy being delivered by the dentist. Here we can see a typical image where a dentist was slowly, 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 slowly slipping off the tooth as they were like curing. You can see how the irradiance goes down, down, down. And this is kind of a shame because the dentist goes and pays a thousand dollars plus for a curing light and then doesn't use it properly because they have never been taught. At the beginning of the presentation I said that light curing could be dangerous. What do I mean by that? Well, blue light can cause photoretinitis, premature aging of the retina, and macular degeneration. This has been well reported. Even back in 1992 we were aware that blue light could cause macular degeneration. Maximum daily exposures have been published both in North America and the EU. Recently, the government of Nova Scotia has issued a hazard alert for blue light in dental offices. And here we can see the address if you want to look at it. Here we can see some publications from 2004 and 2007 on the maximum permissible exposures for ocular safety. And here we can see an article from 2004 about the health hazards associated with curing lights in the dental clinic. I'd like to show you a short abbreviated video on the blue light hazard. The threshold limit values published by the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists. This has nothing to do with dental hygiene by the way. And these limits don't apply just to dentistry. They apply to everywhere where there's a bright light. So if you want to save your eyes from macular degeneration, what do you need to know? First, you need to be aware the maximum blue light hazard occurs at 440 nanometers. And this is very close to the output from dental curing lights. In addition, 440 nanometers is very close to the maximum output from LED headlamps. This one was at 445 nanometers. So this message is for all clinicians who use loops. Your mother told you to never look at the sun through binoculars. And yet, look what we're doing. We're looking at a very bright area using magnification loops. I wondered if this could be a problem. So I evaluated four brands of dental loops. And here we can see they increase the irradiance to the eye by between three to seven times. Watch what can happen when you look at a curing light through loops. Look at those bright spots you can see. Remember, those bright spots are focused onto your retina. As a practical demonstration, let's use a photochromatic disc. Note the spot on the disc. When we move the loops away, we see that bright spot, and that bright spot is the spot on your retina. This was just an abbreviated video. You can see the full video on YouTube at this address. So who is most at risk? Well, children and youths under the age of 20, 
and individuals who have albinism, aphakia, or subluxed lenses are most at risk. This blue light hazard is certainly something to think about and is something that hasn't been very well reported in dentistry so far. And we now recognize that we need to protect our eyes from this bright blue light. This is especially important with curing lights that are becoming so powerful. So when using curing lights, it's really important to use some kind of blue blockers. These are either orange glasses or the orange paddles. To conclude, I think we all realize now that light curing is more complicated than it appears. The mark system measures a problem, that many restorations are not receiving the recommended amount or the recommended type of energy. And the mark system teaches you how to use a curing light by providing you with immediate feedback. Finally, this presentation is intended to introduce you to the concept of the blue light hazard and to make you aware that it's very dangerous to look at the bright blue light. Not only that, you need to be aware that magnification loops can magnify the danger. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact the Price Lab at this address. I'd like to acknowledge the support of my colleagues, Drs. Rugelberg, Strassler, Shortall and Labrie. If you want to read more about Mark, you can read it in the Journal of the Canadian Dental Association. These articles are free download from the website. And if you're interested in finding more about Mark itself, Mark is manufactured and sold by Blue Light Analytics in Halifax.